time, microfinance has been seen as a way out of poverty. It offers small loans to poor families so they can run a business. But in India, it has also created mounting debts, forcing many borrowers to commit suicide. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. This edition of 101 East takes us to the state of Andhra Pradesh, where more than a third of households on microfinance are found. We asked just where it went wrong and what the future holds for microcredit in India. But first, villagers tell Chantal Cho just how the loans landed them with crippling debts. That evening, I poured kerosene on myself and I was about to light a match. My husband broke the door and stopped me. There was commotion. The neighbors came around and consoled us. They said we shouldn't have taken so many loans. Dying wouldn't solve our problems. They told us to think of our two children. That night, my husband and I had a big quarrel. We didn't even have dinner. The next morning, he took the buffalo to the field at 6 a.m. and didn't return for lunch. My father-in-law and I went to look for him. We found him hanged from a tree. He was dead. Rajita and her husband married in 2000. Living in the village of Saipet in southern India, they borrowed money from a rural self-help group to invest in agriculture. But the crops failed and the following years became a nightmare. They took more loans from friends, relatives and money lenders. By 2007, they had borrowed $1,800. Earning $4 a day as farm hands, they struggled to pay their debts. Our expenditure just multiplied. We borrowed money to build a well for the field. We also built a house. Then my mother-in-law fell very ill and died. So many problems over a short time. We kept borrowing money to tide over. The burden increased, but our savings stayed the same. It wasn't enough to pay the debts. We had to keep borrowing. Last year, the microfinance agent came to their doorstep. He offered them a 10,000 rupee loan. That's $220, no questions asked. They were to repay it over 50 weeks at 12.5% interest. Together with other villagers who also took a loan, they formed a joint liability group. Group members were responsible for each other's debts should anyone default in their weekly payment. This became the tipping point when we were unable to pay the installments, the members of our joint liability group harassed us. If I went to the shops, they were there. If I'm working in the fields, they were there. They followed us everywhere, demanded money and insulted us in public. The abuse was relentless. Then the other creditors, the self-help group and private money lenders started chasing us for money as well. It was shameful. We were in deep trouble. In the five days leading up to his suicide, my husband and I quarreled all the time, blaming each other. After her husband's death last October, Rajita left the village with her two sons to live with her father. There's nothing for me to go back to in that village. I have to think about my two children, send them to school. But I'm depending on my parents. I can't think of the future. I have no plan. Since the 1970s, microcredit loans have helped the poor in South Asia by letting them borrow small sums of money to run businesses. In India, 30 million families have taken up loans, a lucrative venture for private microfinance institutes who profited from providing quick loans at high interest rates. But borrowers among the rural poor include many with little experience in running a business. Today, the government is preparing charges in 51 cases of suicide, allegedly linked to coercive methods of debt collection by microfinance institutes 
or MFIs. The suicides we have established after some amount of investigation that were a direct result of the uh, harassment brought in by the MFI agents. The profiteering of the company has become uh, more important than the progress of the people. I think that's where things have uh, gone wrong. And combined with that, there is a lot of stiff competition. So everybody was trying to increase their, uh, increase their market share. So they started offloading a lot of uh, credit on the poor without really looking at uh, whether they require it, whether they can repay it. Indian banks have billions of dollars tied up in the microfinance industry. It's common for MFI interest rates to hit up to 30%. For those who borrow from unscrupulous companies, trouble begins when they fail to meet the weekly payments. There's a lot of hidden costs in the name of processing charges, in the name of insurance, in the name of uh, 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 various uh, recovery charges. They are simply accepting money as it comes. And the moment they accept credit, they are into, uh, into a spiral of a very, very high cost debt. Because they are vulnerable sections, we expect the MFIs to behave in a more transparent uh, and, and more responsible way. Unfortunately, that did not happen. One of the leading MFIs in Andhra Pradesh is Spandana Sporty. It has 5 million borrowers. It says most of them pay on time, even though it doesn't recover debt by force. Within the process, there have been good players, there have been bad players, there have been very good and very bad players as well. Most of the pricing of the loans is basically aimed at covering the costs. And on top of the coverage of costs, there's a margin that we need to maintain such that we are able to meet prudential norms, we are able to meet capital adequacy requirements, we are able to do enough provisions for the loan losses. So we are targeting people who are low-income households, who do not have alternative good access of affordable credit, and trying to offer them credit. And in the process, if they take the monies and they, they are able to improve their life, life uh, and improve their welfare status, why not? Village self-help groups have existed here for decades to empower women, improving access to health care, education and providing low-interest credit from government banks. But they've been overtaken by MFIs who offer larger and faster loans. Banks also prefer MFIs because they recover debts more aggressively. But in the district of Warangal, Fatima Muhammad discovered a downside to MFI loans. She borrowed money to start this tea house. Business didn't take off and she found herself in an unending cycle of debt. I took one microcredit loan, but it wasn't enough. I took a second one to help pay it off, and then the third one to pay off the first two loans. Just like that, I took up five loans within a few years. We meet a group of local women at Fatima's tea house, all of them MFI borrowers. They say a loan agent recently forced them to stay here the whole day for defaulting payments. He threatened them with legal action and incited their joint liability group members to harass and insult them. Their family members had to borrow money or give up valuables for their release. I felt suicide was the only option. I drenched myself with kerosene and tried to set myself on fire. My family members stopped me and our neighbours came and talked me out of it. With many rural borrowers driven to the point of suicide, Questions have been raised about microfinance. Is it easing poverty in places like this? Or is it contributing to a cycle of debt? Has the industry grown so fast that regulations haven't been able to catch up? Late last year, authorities in Andhra Pradesh passed a stringent law to restrict how microfinance companies can lend and collect money. Three simple points. One, there should not be multiple lending. There has to be a credit bureau which, uh, which monitors every loan that's given and every loan that's repaid. Second, there has to be greater transparency in, in, in the interest rates and in the way they do the business. Third thing is, the cost of the loan cannot be too heavy because you are, you are really lending to the poor. The new laws reduced loans and repayments to a trickle. Today, the industry faces a crisis with borrowers resisting payments and banks reluctant to lend more money. 
Andhra Pradesh accounts for more than a third of India's microfinance loans, almost $2 billion. It's a bad debt nobody wants. The economy will be in doldrums first because the, so much of financial flow went in and these institutions are not able to get it back, to reinvest it, repump in the economy. Then the growth, economy, the growth of the economy will be uh, capped. And there, there is a need because microfinance institutions also contribute to the uh, economic growth. But Professor Gallup believes the long-term solution is to strengthen the ability of self-help groups to provide credit. Because unlike MFIs, the money they earn from interest is retained within the community for further loans. So if we can provide adequate credit from the self-group itself, by including the poorest of the poor, then there may not be space for the microfinance institutions to work on. To do that, self-help groups need better support from the banks something the government recognizes. We are taking all the steps to improve this uh, uh, bank linkage, as well as uh, community investment fund is also given to them. TFI loans are given, cash credit loans are given to them. So we are trying to improve more and strengthen this self-help groups day by day. As we know, this bank is also uh, are giving a loan to the MFIs. And also on the same hand, uh, they are giving loan to the self-help groups through government. So this is uh, um, ultimately leads to the social obligations. Such proposals are too late for someone like Rajita, whose husband hanged himself in desperation over their mounting debts. If social obligations continue to be blurred by profit-making, microcredit may well turn from boon to burden for many more of India's rural poor. That report by Chantal Cho. For more on whether microfinance is a boon or a burden to India's rural poor, we're in Andhra Pradesh, a state that accounts for more than 30% of the country's micro-loan industry. Joining us now is Anurag Agarwal, the senior vice president and co-founder of IntelliCap International. Politician Veera Bodapati is from the Communist Party of India and an outspoken critic of microcredit. Professor Revati Elanki is from the Center of Economics and Social Science. Thank you very much for being with us today. Anurag, if I could start with you. When microfinance was first introduced to India, it was seen as the financial salvation for the rural poor. Has it been successful at all? We think uh, that microfinance is uh, an enabler. It provides access to finance, which is one of the key uh, things that you need uh, to run a business. So just like you, me, or any, any of a large, any, any large corporate requires access to credit, so do the poor when they want to run their business. And uh, the regular financial institutions in the country were not willing to deal with them. And that's what microfinance provided. So it was an enabler by, but just microfinance by itself wasn't something that is going to, you know, get them out of poverty. Veera Bodapati, may I, I'll just throw that same question to you as well. How successful has microfinance been in India? Has it been able to alleviate poverty? Only 25% of the people are spending on income generating activities. The rest of the 75% are spending this money in other activities. And what other, other activities would that be? Uh, health, education, our house, our, uh, some TV sets, buying TV sets and other things. If you take the statistics itself, you can't say that it's uh, going to uh, eradicate poverty among the poor. Most of the people, uh, they, they have used this money for their day-to-day -day consumption purposes. Well, Professor Revati, is it fair to say then that microfinance is a failure? Uh, I think institutional finance has failed to reach the poor in India, and more so in Andhra Pradesh. Because in Andhra Pradesh, indebtedness levels are high, and especially rural indebtedness, and the rural people are mostly depending on informal sources. So that's one failure of the info, formal or institutional credits. So the gap has been to some extent filled by the institutions like microfinance. It also went for high interest rates, which could not be borne by the, the burden was uh, heavy for the poor. Well, let me just pick up on that particular point and throw it back to Anurag. Is it wrong that microfinance companies are now commercialized and now trying to make a profit? Uh, After I all, they did start as a non-profit organization. I've worked very closely with pretty much all the leading microfinance institution promoters. And I can say their starting out objective was that. But I think over the years, as, as they grew, as they spent more time in the industry, they realized that this not-for-profit uh, model 
doesn't work because uh, you know this activity requires a lot of capital you're talking about a huge market a huge uh, need for credit and for that you need a large amount of capital so they actually transform into for profit entities because it required the for profit entity model was required for scale because it needed capital to come in the banks would not lend till equity comes into these uh, models is it wrong that they make a profit it is after no, all a business when you, venture when you, when you say that these microfinancial institutions are meant for eradication of poverty among the poor people and if you throw out that concept of uh, eradication of poverty and if you want to make profit there is no objection but you are saying that these institutions are in a panacea for the reduction of poverty when you are saying that are you are you uh, going to make profit as the main motive or are you going to make no, i uh, think uh, uh, i think that, that, that is the wrong place the to start with in the first place the moment you put microfinance in the position where you know this is the tool and it's going to eradicate poverty i don't think uh, you know poverty goes away if you take a loan do you uh, you know uh, become richer because by taking a loan it's what you do with the loan and how you utilize it determines whether you you become richer or poorer well professor isn't this the case i mean where does social corporate responsibility lie where does making a profit lie is there a balance if uh, from government sources they are getting low credit at a low cost then why do they lend at a high cost that's question one and uh, they started off like they have uh, uh, transaction costs what are called as transaction costs and they have to cover all those and of course that's fine but making profit out of that and from the poverty profit out of poverty i think that's that thin razor thin kind of thing is not uh, strictly followed here and uh, the trouble was like uh, uh, how to distinguish between these but two. at the same time earlier on you, you, you know vera you were saying that a majority of these loans don't actually go to business ventures a lot of them goes to consumerism buying a new house buying a new television is that the fault of the microfinance companies it's not is it how can you blame no, them no, no. for I, I, the social I'm not, problems I'm not and what's wrong in buying a new house or sending I, your children for education no i, I am think not that's the most productive use of money no no one of the one of the one of the important factor for the indebtedness of the poor people is uh, taking many loans from many microfinancial institutions and bringing them and buying some asset which don't generate uh, income to pay that uh, uh, debt that But again, is the, whose fault is that that is not the microfinance company's fault no, no, is no, it no these microfinancial institutions in their in their brochure they are saying they are they are going to eradicate poverty and they are going to educate the people they are going to train the people how to uh evolve income generating activities and why all those uh, things to be written in the, and why you, they are giving uh, loans for consumer uh, and other things i agree with him that uh, there is a real problem of multiple borrowing and i think that as an industry uh, having worked very closely with the industry players i know they were acutely aware of and in fact they were even working on that there was a problem doesn't mean that you know you throw the baby out with the bath water there was a problem in se but, certain but select sectors when, when if you look at overall at a macro level india is still highly underpenetrated when it comes to financial inclusion so just because in certain select uh, pockets where there was concentration and there was this issue of multiple borrowing doesn't mean that you go and destroy a full industry when you are saying that you are using this microfinance as a panacea for poverty reduction how can you do all these things no, i think it's a larger issue you know Professor. it's a, a larger issue in the sense it's related to the economy and these are the people who are for the first time uh, coming to an interface with uh, maybe uh, taking loans and getting into the uh, cycle of consumerism uh, the financial discipline has to be built into them actually so actually that proper groundwork has to be done in fact in andhra pradesh which is a state which has experimented with these uh, groups sag groups for women because all of these microfinance institutions have targeted the women and they they are lending to the women so that groundwork has been here in fact uh, mfis have entered in a very very favorable kind of situation in andhra pradesh and they started lending to the uh, women uh, women groups and uh, naturally the for the first time women were seen in the family families are who, who get credit from outside sources and some women have taken advantage of it because we have uh, conducted a field level study especially where there are good sources of income like non farm sector and allied agriculture women who have taken loans from mfis have really benefited from that anurag let me ask you this question then do you think the industry would benefit from some government regulation if the government did step in 
Absolutely. I think uh, regulation is much required. And in fact, uh, the problem that the crisis of microfinance that we see right now is because there was no proper regulation. And that's why the state governments, uh, you know, came in and came out with an act which uh, actually effectively killed the business. So uh, regulation is much needed. In fact, the industry itself has been crying for uh, no, regulation. The state government didn't kill. There is a bill Polit which is uh, pending. Political leaders killed. <laughs> Because yeah, somebody, how how did the political leaders <laughs> kill the, the Some industry? Some political leaders uh, openly said that you don't pay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think that is extremely irresponsible in any uh, in any economy. If uh, if there are you know institutions which are doing financial transactions, uh, large or small, with poor or rich, if if you know politicians come out and say that you don't need to pay tomorrow, these institutions will come down and it'll spoil the entire business environment and it'll actually take us back uh, multiple decades. <laughs> Perhaps we're being too idealistic here about microfinance. Is that a fair enough assumption? Can you actually have a business that makes profit, but at the same time helps the rural poor? Professor, what do you think? It's not uh, just like throwing money for charity, but it's uh, uh, making reasonable kind of uh, operational costs are covered but that's not too much too high profits but it's also helping the poor like because uh, uh, they're, uh, they're uh, unable to re receive any funds from the institutional sources so there are experiments all those regulatory suggestions if they are implemented microfinancial institutions can be can be brought under uh, some uh, uh, type of regulation and it may help the poor also Anurag, is it too idealistic perhaps to expect microfinance companies to be able to forego large profits to help the rural poor? Even with those interest rate caps and margin caps, etc., uh, I think uh, these MFIs can still do a sustainable business and uh, a business which can generate decent returns for the MFIs, uh, for the investors who invest in these MFIs. Uh, they can borrow from banks at commercial rates. They can, uh, you know, provide this uh, facility to uh, the borrowers and, uh, and still make a reasonable return, provided they are able to scale their business. Because this business is all about scale. And, and she spoke about, you know, this transaction cost. So the transaction costs are going to be spread over a larger unit, then the, those costs can also bring, uh, be brought down. But let's go back to the discussion again, the question of where does this money actually go? Uh, for poorer people, there are certain uh, issues that government has to address. Because government left all those areas, and the people are forced to take loans to satisfy their own. Take, for example, health. Health is an important issue. Uh, people, even poor people, they can't uh, uh, allow their children to die. These poor people were forced to, do, uh, to use that money because our public health system collapsed. And even poor people have no access or no confidence in their thing. They are forced to go to the private sector and they have to spend this money. So there is a linkage between uh, government uh, withdrawal of, from these sectors. We can't blame the poor people uh, who took finance uh, from those uh, institutions and spend on health sector. We can't blame it. But it is not going to generate any income. Finally, how do you think the government or the people of India can ensure that microfinance actually works and actually helps alleviate poverty? I think uh, through sensible regulation and responsible lending, uh, both on the part of the provider of credit and the one who's receiving it. Vera? Government uh, has to enter in certain sectors and provide uh, social welfare measures. Then only they can use this money to income generating activities. Otherwise, this money will be diverted to other activities and it's going to uh, push these people into debt trap. Professor? Yeah, I think there should be some regulation, of course. So MFIs are seen as a penetration un unless it's regulated uh, it may be a burden, it's a boon or a bane is uh, decided whether how the government tackles the question. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have for this edition of 101 East. You can always follow the program through our website, podcast and Facebook. From all the team here in India, thanks for watching.